why are we here? Can I have a relationship with God? These kinds of things I can't measure with my microscope or my telescope. Hope deranges us. Hope breaks things and breaks things down. Christianity isn't some kind of self-help doctrine. It's not probiotics for the soul or something, you know? <laughs> he was using the parable of the Good Samaritan to justify bombing Syria. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Simon Smart. Now, recently, the Sydney Morning Herald ran an interview with former CEO of World Vision, Tim Costello. And they were quoting him as calling our government's foreign aid strategy as mean, embarrassing and foolish. And in the article, he talks about the profound difference between the cost of living and the cost of lifestyle. And that really, our concern over cost of living as Australians is resulting in a huge loss of perspective. And with Australian aid at historic lows, he's urging governments to act and show moral leadership. Well, this article got us thinking about an episode we published back in 2016, where we attempted to untangle some sticky ethical questions around the idea of extravagance. How could we, with a clear conscience, ever spend money on any extravagance, from luxury holidays to our morning coffee, when that money could go to save someone who's suffering from some terrible disease or perhaps to alleviate someone's hunger? Natasha Moore hosted this conversation with John Dixon and myself. It's in two parts, and in this first half, we discuss poverty and luxury. I hope you enjoy it. This week on Life and Faith, we're doing something a little bit unusual. We're talking about a theme that is a bit hard to pin down. I'm calling it extravagance, but really it's more complicated than that. One of the inspirations that got us thinking about this topic was a comment that someone made on our Facebook page a few months ago. We posted a Life and Faith episode that we'd done where we spoke to a few of the brains behind a new museum currently being built in Washington, D.C., the Museum of the Bible. It's this massive project on a Smithsonian kind of scale, and it's meant to cost about $400 million. And someone wrote this in response. Surely it is better to spend the time, money and energy required for this project on putting what Jesus said into practice. What about feeding the homeless on the streets of DC? Which is a legit question, right? $400 million could alleviate a lot of human suffering. But it's a slippery slope if we're truly paying attention to the misery and the pain that's going on all around us, near and far away, how can we ever spend money on, say, a pair of nice shoes or an expensive holiday or even our morning coffee when that money could go to feed someone who is starving or cure someone who's dying from a preventable disease? And then what about art? What about museums and parks and cathedrals? How can we spend money on beautiful things or time on things like writing poetry or playing sport when people's basic needs in order to survive aren't even being met. There are a few related and quite complicated ethical questions here. So we're going to do this show in two parts. Next week, we're going to think specifically about beauty and function. How can we justify things like art and culture? But today we're looking at poverty and luxury. Can we ever justify spending money on ourselves instead of those who plainly need it more than we do? UNICEF reports that in 2011, 6.9 million children under five died from preventable poverty-related diseases. 6.9 million is 19,000 children dying every day. Does it really matter that we're not walking past them in the street? Does it really matter that they're far away? I don't think it does make a morally relevant difference. What is really important is, can we reduce that death toll? Can we save some of those 19,000 children dying every day? And the answer is, yes, we can. This is the philosopher Peter Singer giving a TED Talk in 2013 on effective altruism. Effective altruism is a growing movement that aims to change our culture so that we'll give more of what we can spare to charity and so that we'll give more to causes that have been shown by solid research to do the most good to the most people. Back in 1971, in East Bengal, there was a genocide followed by a terrible cyclone in a place that was already very poor. At least nine million people became destitute refugees. The international community raised some money to help, but not enough. Thousands and thousands of people starved to death. 
In response, Peter Singer wrote a now famous essay called Famine, Affluence and Morality. He posed a kind of thought experiment. He wrote, if I'm walking past a shallow pond and see a child drowning in it, I ought to wade in and pull the child out. This will mean getting my clothes muddy, but this is insignificant while the death of the child would presumably be a very bad thing. So far, everyone would agree, presumably. Singer then goes on to ask, basically, what's the difference between the child drowning in front of you and the millions of children far away who will die just the same if you don't do something to prevent it? Lots of people have been influenced over the years by this essay. One of them is Toby Ord. So he's a philosopher at Oxford, though both he and Peter Singer are originally from Australia. And in 2009, he started the Giving What We Can movement, which asks people to pledge at least 10% of their income over their lifetime. Some people pledge a lot, lot more than that. So far, it has nearly 2,000 members worldwide who've donated more than $15 million and pledged to donate more than $700 million over their working lives. This is all very encouraging. Surely almost all of us could spare more money for charities and probably can agree that we should. But there's also a bit of a black hole here. How can we ever justify spending anything on ourselves beyond the most basic of our needs when there's so much suffering in the world? And how can we justify spending money to help those close to us if the same amount of money would help more people elsewhere? One ethicist put it this way, if your mother was drowning over here and two strangers were drowning over there and you could save either your mum or the strangers, is Singer really suggesting that you should save the strangers instead? Obviously, there are some knotty ethical problems here, so I'm going to ask Simon Smart and John Dixon to try to solve them for us. Are you guys up for this? Yeah, this should be pretty easy. Sure. Okay, let's try to sum up the ethical dilemmas here in a few questions. So firstly, Simon, John, what do you think of the example that Peter Singer gives? Is there any moral difference between walking past a child who's drowning in a pond because you don't want to get your clothes muddy and allowing children far away to die of preventable diseases because you didn't give away more of your money. I think he's onto something. And uh, in some ways it sounds like an echo of the Christian tradition to me. How so? Well, Christianity has always called on people to care for the stranger. And that, of course, is the stranger right in front of you. Um, but you have a strong tradition in the New Testament of caring for people miles away. So the Apostle Paul collected money from Gentiles throughout Turkey and Greece uh, for the famine-ravaged people of Judea, whom they'd never met and probably would never meet. Um, where I get a little bit nervous is in the kind of utilitarian approach to it and, and a, a very sort of formulaic numbers approach. These mm. two people uh, outweigh my mum. But I think that's um, a dehumanising approach to the ethical dilemma because my mum has given me so much, uh, I'm formed by her, I'm bound to her in a way that is good and right. And I am to honour her in a way that is above uh, the stranger around me. And that that's right because it's valuing the relationship I have to my mother, um, which doesn't have to be played off against the strangers whom I also value and care for and you can't just reduce it to numbers. Yeah, I, I think Peter Singer, I'd mostly want to be clapping him, really. He's, he's urging people towards thoughtfulness and generosity to people in great need, and he does it himself, um, and I think there's a lot to be admired in that. Uh, even 20 or 30 years ago, you could pretty much be ignorant of most of the suffering around the world, but now it's so close. We can see it. It's, you know, it's tweeted every minute, and so we have less of an excuse to be at least aware of the suffering of other people. And so I think what singers are urging you towards is mostly a good thing. I have a slight philosophical parenthetical debate with Singer, which oh, yes. can maybe just sit by the side. And that is his entire argument for caring for the person right in front of you or anyone is the feeling of empathy that has evolved in the human being. That's the basis of morality. There isn't any higher law calling us to do this. It's the empathy that one feels. And I just want to raise the question, if the feeling of empathy that has evolved in me toward the child I see right in front of me and all those chemical reactions that take place, if that's the basis of morality, then he doesn't actually have a way of grounding my care 
for the person I don't see who's suffering because by definition my instincts aren't aroused by what I can't see and if those instincts are the basis of the effort to care you don't have a reason to care. So, but that's philosophical and parenthetical. I don't <laughs> want to take away from what Simon says mm. that I think his, his instincts, I, I would say, are actually Christian instincts and they are to be applauded. Yeah, as much as he won't acknowledge that. <laughs> of course not. Yeah. Another conundrum then, getting more to the heart of this utilitarian thinking. One of the examples that Peter Singer uses in his TED Talk is about the effective part of effective altruism. He says that to provide a guide dog for a blind person, it costs about $40,000 to train one guide dog. It costs between 20 and 50 bucks to cure a blind person in a developing country if they have trachoma. That means that for the same amount of money, you can help out one blind person in a developed country, or you can cure between 400 and 2,000 people elsewhere. Singer says, I think it's pretty clear what the better thing is to do. Discuss. Yeah, I get a bit nervous when he starts to talk in this way. And we mentioned utilitarian thinking, the sort of you know, the greatest good for the greatest number, but there's many limitations and problems with that. Not the least being we're not always great judges of what our action will actually do. And so that sort of calculus where you would, you would actually deny one person your compassion because you imagine that some other action will be, do some sort of greater good does seem a bit dehumanising to me. But this is a pretty clear, like someone will be cured of blindness. That is a good um, and it's going to cost a lot less than, I mean, the problem with this thinking really is that we would never provide guide dogs for blind people if this is the case. Well, that's right. Who's going to be the one to say to the blind per local blind person, look, we've decided some other calculus is going to mean that you get nothing, but we can heal a whole lot more people in Africa. The other reality is there's more than enough money in the world to do both. <laughs> so each individual faced with this uh, in the West um, has to think, okay, well, I do want to help the absolute poor. Does that mean I give everything to them and nothing to um, Guide Dogs Australia? I don't think so because I want to be a responsible human being in the place God has called me. Now, this is something Peter Singer doesn't have up his sleeve and when all he's got really is evolutionary empathy to throw that little quip in. Um, <laughs> whereas a Christian has evolutionary empathy, of course, but also a whole matrix view of the world that makes compassion reasonable. And one of the factors a Christian has to bring in is where has God called me? And, and what does it mean to be faithful as someone who lives where I live, surrounded by people with needs right around me? I can't deny their needs on grounds that my money would go further elsewhere. I, I want to do both. Okay, one more question, and this is kind of related to that idea of where am I called, what am I called to do? The co-founder of the Giving What We Can movement, a philosopher called Will McCaskill, he founded a brother organisation called 80,000 Hours. It's meant to help altruistically minded people think about the hours of their working lives and how they can do the most good with it. So the idea, put a little bit crudely, is that maybe you shouldn't go and work for a charity if what you really want to do is help people you should actually become an investment banker because you'll earn far more money that you can then give away so becoming an aid worker might be personally satisfying for you but you'll be able to help far more people by making loads of money what do you guys think no it <laughs> seems very reductionist to me it doesn't allow for different natures the way we're wired up differently the way john could do so be who he is in a way that, that serves other people and I could do it and it's a different thing. I mean, we all know that if I became a merchant banker, that wouldn't be good for anyone, uh, <laughs> you know, because I'm just not wired up that way. A, a different way of thinking would be that you sort of see the way in which God has called you into the, into the world to be a blessing to other people. I think you can do that in huge, that's, that's what's wonderful about this, right? You can do that in a huge uh, range of different ways that kind of honours who every person is and this sort of equation that you've given us maybe again well intentioned but it does feel a bit cold to me it unravels 2000 years of christian influence on the west is what it does because the greeks and romans had a very um fixed idea of everyone in their place doing not the thing they are called to do but the thing that external conditions force upon them and this is just another version of that whereas edwin judge the great historian will point out that, that one of the gifts of Christianity to the West is the idea that each individual has been called by God to a particular expression of gifts in the world and that it is a fundamental good 
to express those gifts where you are according to how God's wired you for the good of others. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, John. I'd have to say too, I wouldn't want us to sound like we're discouraging this sort of effort to get people to be more generous and thoughtful. And gosh, if, if even a few people started taking these guys seriously, I think they'd be a, a working towards something better. But it is worth thinking about what lies at the foundation of this. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Simon Smart. Today we've gone back to 2016 and running what was a popular episode discussing the ethical dilemma around the subject of extravagance. In the first half of the show, we discussed the idea of poverty and luxury. And in this next part, we're looking at beauty and function. We're thinking about a topic that sounds a bit abstract, but that really goes to the heart of what we think we're here for as humans and how we can live lives that are satisfying and useful, lives that make the world a better place. Is it frivolous and cruel to build a museum when you could feed so many starving people with the money that that costs? Or how about throwing a party? How about spending time writing poetry or playing cricket? These are questions that I found myself asking when I went to see a film recently, a documentary called The First Monday in May. So it goes behind the scenes of the Met Gala in New York and what it looks like to organise maybe the world's most glamorous party. And then Jennifer Lawrence says, ladies and gentlemen, Rihanna. Ah! Whoa! Got a party tonight! This is the queen of the night! Sense of mystery and danger. This room is a dream. I think fashion should be recognized. What's up, Neville? When it touches people and moves people. I mean, what more can you ask from art? The First Monday in May is a fascinating film about this very opulent world of art and fashion and celebrity. And watching it, you feel kind of torn, or I felt kind of torn, between feeling how beautiful and glamorous and I'm glad this kind of thing exists, you know, this art and beauty and pleasure, even if I, an ordinary schmo, will never ever be part of something like this, but also feeling like it's all a bit obscene. Like, how does anyone justify the expense and the human dedication that goes into this fashion exhibition and this big social do? Once again, I have Simon Smart and John Dixon here. And we're going to try to make some headway on this ethical dilemma of art versus material needs, or beauty, if you will, versus function. Last week, we quoted a person who wrote on our Facebook wall in response to a podcast that we did on this new museum opening in DC, the Museum of the Bible. They wrote, Surely it is better to spend the time, money and energy required for this project on putting what Jesus said into practice. What about feeding the homeless on the streets of DC? John, how would you answer that person? How can anyone justify spending $400 million on a museum when people are starving and homeless? It depends if it's a good to highlight the Bible. Um, If it's not a good, like a grand good, then of course you shouldn't. I mean, the argument makes sense, but the assumption behind the argument is it's not good to highlight the Bible's inspiration for Western culture, which is what that Bible museum is about. And Um, If we decide it is a grand good to highlight the Bible's influence, ongoing influence, then it's surely worth $400 million more, and especially since it is in fact the influence of the Bible that has created this charity culture that the West has at the centre. Is it kind of about ranking goods? How do we we go about ranking things? I don't think you can... I don't think you can mathematically rank goods... There are certain things that are highlighted as great goods for the Christian, this is, right? And they will include care for the poor as a, as, as a theme that's throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament. But then uh, the arts are highlighted as goods. Creativity is highlighted as a good. Joy and um, pleasure and banqueting and friendship are highlighted as, as goods. And I would say that if you have to deny those other goods in order to pursue one good, that is care for the poor, then it's not a full, full-orbed full Christian view of life. But I would much rather uh, say, let's do both. Let's spend $400 million on highlighting the Bible, especially 
as the Bible so terrifically influential and inspirational for all of life. Uh, but let's also spend more than that, as in fact we do, on, uh, on, on aid work. I mean, 400 million is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket of charity work in the US. Yeah, and the museum does look pretty cool, actually. <laughs> There'd be somewhere, though, there's a line somewhere where it would drift over, wouldn't it, into obscene? Probably, but um, it's, it, it's obviously hard to work out. And I don't think you, make, you can make ethical decisions based on the sort of the, the polarities here. There's a, it's a little more art than science. But I would just affirm that it's about judging what the goods are and not denying goods for the sake of another good. There's a specific question here about, you know, art and beauty. Um, I once had this quite heated conversation with a scientist. So I was doing my PhD in literature at the time. And he explained to me that we shouldn't even have the humanities, that if everybody devoted their resources to curing cancer, I think was the example he used, we'd arrive at a solution far more quickly. So why are we, or his point was, why was I, wasting time on things like poetry. Yeah, Simon. Fair enough too, I'd say. <laughs> and I can imagine you, that when you just yeah, said, yeah, it, sure, it, I see your point. It, it, it yeah. wasn't the most civil of conversations. No, you're yeah. talking to somewhat of a philistine there, surely. <laughs> I mean, this is, um, if you took that sort of logic, you'd never sit with a small child and read them a beautiful story. You Dang wouldn't on. knit you, them you a You wouldn't blanket. even have a child. If you really took this seriously, you'd go, hang on, every kid's going to cost me $200,000 by the time I kick him out of the house. So I should save that $200,000 and give it to World Vision. There you go. Exactly. So, and, and, the, and the, the wonder of music and art and literature, uh, perhaps not you know, resonating with your friend, but for many of us, those things are rich, they're the richness of what it is to be human. And um, it's a scary logic that starts to mm. want to deny those things in favour of some supposed other good. The only good that's operating uh, for this person uh, or, or that whole argument is survival, which is unsurprising since probably survival of the fittest is, you know, in the background here. But that isn't the Christian calling. Survival isn't the calling. The flourishing for, for all that we are meant to be. See, Christians do believe that um, human beings are called to a number of great ends and survival isn't the end. There are many other ends. And so it's a reductionist view. Now, I happen to have had a conversation, with, this is name dropping here, um, a <laughs> conversation a with the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, about this very topic recently when we were talking to him <laughs> about our you, documentary. <laughs> so why not pull that out of my back pocket and hear what he said in answer to that type of question about beauty and whether that has any usefulness. The whole idea that it's worth spending time and money and putting resource into the arts is not very popular in or out of universities. It reflects an idea that our primary job as human beings is problem solving. We need all the time to increase our capacity to solve problems. So we need to increase our technological reach, our scientific exactitude, because all problems reduce to problems of managing the stuff around us. And that sounds very simple until you realize that, of course, no actual human being works in that way and that the problems that are most resistant to solution are problems for which you need not information but imagination. That was Rowan Williams talking about art and beauty and the purpose of the humanities. I really wish I'd had him on hand when I was having this argument with a scientist about why I was bothering to study literature. Well, we've been thinking in this two-part episode about some of the complexities of altruism and charity and culture and how we spend our money and our time. To finish off this discussion, we thought we'd look at a story that encapsulates in just a few sentences a bunch of these issues and questions. It's a story about Jesus and a woman who does something unexpected at a dinner party that he's at. Here's the story. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus' disciples ask the same question that we've been looking at. They look at this gesture where 
this perfume was worth maybe a year's wages. And they kind of go, how can we justify the wastefulness of buying expensive things or of beautiful gestures like this when we could do something much more pragmatic and look after the people who are most desperate? John, do you think that this old story has some wisdom for us as we wrestle with these questions? Well, I don't want to reach in and find too many sort of practical uh, references for our podcast um, (laughs) because it's not what the text is for. The text is clearly pointing toward Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and the way this woman, even without knowing it, um, has anointed him for burial because he's, he's going to his death. But the the principle that is in the story is that there are goods that aren't simply caring for the poor that we can be lavish toward. And so that is a principle that you do find in Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, the the lavishness of people's gifts to build the temple uh, would be one example. In the New Testament, um, the Apostle Paul says God has given us, in speaking to the rich in particular in 1 Timothy, he says God has given us all good things for our enjoyment, command the rich to be rich in good deeds and willing to share. In other words, the rich are allowed to richly enjoy the benefits of bounty and creation because that's a good, it's, it's something for which we are created, but they must do it with a consciousness of the poor. And I don't think Jesus is saying to the disciples, hey, the poor don't matter compared to me, da, da, da. but um, he does say that the poor will always be with you. And this is virtually a quotation from a passage in the Old Testament that says, because the poor will always be with you, you must be open-handed toward them. And so in context, people wouldn't have heard it as the poor don't matter. He's saying, the poor will always be with you and you'll have many opportunities as you should to open your hand to them. But there is something very profound. There is a great good right here, right now, that is worth lavishing mm. with your love. And so I, I think I can you know, comfortably extend that to the kind of, um, to look for other goods in human culture where we can be lavish because they are goods. And when you lavish things, you signify their meaning and importance. In fact, as you know, I just spent a few months in the, glorious and lavish buildings of Oxford University where I was pursuing a research project. And, you know, every day I got to sit in the Bodleian, this extraordinary ancient library, um, the Duke Humphreys room. And, and, and one thing was very striking to me as I looked up on the walls and, and saw the little paintings and the, the gilding and all this. I thought, wow, the effort gone into this just, just to create this impression of lavishness for the sake of highlighting how important reading books is, how important study is, how important learning is. So the, the, the buildings could just be boxes in the suburbs of Oxford and they could sell everything else, sure, but we wouldn't be signifying the importance and beauty of learning. Yeah, so, so there could be a functional aspect to this, right? Sell the buildings, go and make a really nice, you know, send a train out to the suburbs for some, some box, but... It reminds me of the Soviet era architecture in, in not only Russia, but lots of parts of Eastern Europe where you had these huge, awful buildings that were incredibly functional, but in, in the end ended up being soul crushing uh, environments for people. This is a, there's a whole lot about this sort of discussion that goes somewhere towards what's really key about being human. It's a beautiful picture of balance, I suppose, balanced human life. I think it's safe to say there's no one easy answer for this moral dilemma. In fact, the answers will look different for different people. But it should at least offer a challenge to think carefully about not only the many good things life can offer us, but also our responsibilities to those who have little. Please do tell your friends about Life and Faith. It's the best way to spread the word. Next week... When I finally realised, Crumbs, I think this is true, I remember um, I was away... Uh, with friends, we were camping uh, on a mountain called Mount Olympus at the time, and I w- chain smoked my way through 40 cigarettes. And I can remember just thinking, I actually think this is true, but I don't want it to be. So I can remember coming away from that experience on my own and going to find a few of my friends who weren't Christians and saying to them, I think I'm going to become a Christian today, and I'm telling you now because from now on I won't be enjoying myself anymore. <laughs> I was 100% sure that I was sacrificing on the altar of truth my only chance for happiness in this world. Mm-hmm.